You know this? <laughs> so why do I like this? Why do I use it so much? Why is this a great prop for talks that I give? What is it about this that makes it so effective? At least I think it's effective because I use it so often. Better be. What does the iPhone represent? What does it mean? Why is this so important, at least to me? Well, I think it represents what we've been talking about so far, at least on the side of, of, uh, of egoism and selfishness. It represents taking your life seriously. It represents taking your life seriously both in its production. Think about Steve Jobs. Think about what he represents. Think about the focus, the energy, the single-mindedness, and his emphasis on beauty and efficiency and just the creative genius that he was, the energy he projected, and the product that he made. So here's a symbol of somebody taking his life seriously. It represents what Keith talked about in terms of, I think it was Keith, in terms of value for value, the trader principle. Here's a product that Steve Jobs made. And that I love. He made money off of it. And it was an expression of his ability, his passion, his worldview. So he benefited. And I benefit, as I say many times in my talk. This is worth a lot more than the $1,000 I paid for it. For a variety of reasons. Which I've talked about over and over again. And so you get... The producer's passion, you get, and, and kind of taking life seriously, you get the trader principle, and then you get my use of it. I mean, I love this because it's attached to my hip, and I use it all the time. And I use it all the time for what? I use it to enhance my life, to learn about the world, to listen to music, to navigate, to get to the crazy places I go to. Because I take my life seriously, I want a tool that allows me to maximize my ability to live, to execute on my life. So the iPhone really represents a lot of what we're talking about in a sense of, in, in, in a sense of our attitudes towards it, how we use it, and how it was produced, and this idea of the trader system. And of course, in that sense, it represents what capitalism is all about. It represents what capitalism is about, because what is capitalism about at the end of the day? What is capitalism all about? Why do we care about capitalism? Why should we care about capitalism? Because capitalism is the system of the pursuit of happiness. It's a system that allows us to pursue our own values as producers, as consumers, as traders. It's not just some abstract theory. It's not just some abstract system. It is the only system in human history that leaves us free to pursue our values as individuals that allows us to pursue our ultimate value, our happiness, our life, our flourishing, our success as human beings. And, you know, this is why it's so important. This is why I'm so passionate about it. Not because it's Pareto optimal, which, you know, by some definitions, maybe it is. But that's meaningless. Because it makes my life, has the potential to make my life better and all of your lives better. It's because it means something to each one of us. It makes it possible for us to pursue our happiness. How does it do that? Why is capitalism the system of the pursuit of happiness? Why does it make that possible? How does that work? Why is it the only political, social, economic system consistent with egoism? And why is it inconsistent with altruism? We heard two talks today about what altruism is and about what selfishness is. This is the system of selfishness. 
And selfishness is the morality of happiness, the morality of life. Well, because, as Keith told us, to be an egoist, to be selfish requires what? What is Ayn Rand's morality? What's the one key virtue, the, 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 the one key reason, rationality? We need to be able to think. We need to be able to solve problems. We need to be able to figure out how to live. We're not programmed with that knowledge. We don't have that embedded in our genes. We don't know how to live instinctually. We have to choose how we live. We have to learn how to live. We have to evaluate the world, evaluate reality, set goals, and figure out how to achieve those goals, how to achieve those values. We have to use our mind. Our mind is our only tool to be able to achieve those values, to pursue those goals. So reason is our means to that end, the end being life, the end being flourishing, the end being happiness. Reason is the way we attain that. And reason has one crucial enemy. Rationality has one thing where we, you just can't, you can't be rational. Or being rational is irrelevant. It doesn't make any difference. So there's one context in which you cannot produce an iPhone. You might have, you, you won't even try to produce an iPhone. Just like, for example, there are lots of medicines today. There's a lot of research today. The sun, nobody even tried. Because of what? What is the thing that makes it impossible, really, to be rational, to use reason, to think? Of course, a gun. Only points a gun to the back of your head. It doesn't matter what you think. And why bother? Because it doesn't matter what you think. All that matters is you better do what you're told. Otherwise, life is over. Indeed, you can see force manifest itself all over our society today. You know, one application of it is regulation, right? If I tell you that you need permission in order to start a business, and that permission will not be granted to you if you start this type of business, then you're not even going to think about starting this type. It's walled off a whole section of reality from you because there's nothing you can do about it. There's no actual application you can do because somebody has said, if you are involved here, there's no permission. You're never going to be able to make a living at it. You're never going to be able to do anything practical with it. You know, there's plenty of areas within, for example, uh, bio, biotechnology that have been walled off by regulation. We basically said, you know, we don't approve stuff like that. Even the way, you know, there's a lot of talk today about life extension and life extension medicine. There's a lot of research and a lot of stuff. But all of it is within certain walls because they, because they have to first cure disease because the FDA will not approve things that are just life extending. So nobody does just life extending. So, I mean, and that's just one little area. There are thousands of these that exclude human thought. Or take our history in which new innovators, new thinkers were often burnt at the stake. Well, that makes clear what I should do. Not get burnt at the stake. If my life is of value, I'm not going to think. So, Force is the one enemy of reason, therefore the one enemy of self-interest, of the pursuit of happiness. And other people inflicting force on you is the thing that you want to make sure you don't encounter. If we're going to have a society, if we're going to live among other people, and there's a huge value to doing so, then force is the one thing we want to extract. Force is the one thing we want to make sure we don't deal with one another using because it is an negation of the thing that makes life possible. A mind, a reasoning, a rational capability. And that's this concept of the concept of individual rights is 
captures that idea. It captures the idea that in a society, in a civilized society, is what we're striving toward. Force is unacceptable. Individual rights is the concept that says that each one of us as an individual is free, free to use your mind to pursue your values. Free of what? Free of the use of force on you. And notice that this concept implicitly assumes what? That you should pursue your values. That pursuing your values is a good thing. And that using your mind to pursue the values is the right way to do it. It excludes this idea. I think there was an, uh, this question about interest. About uh, what about the bad guy who has, thinks he has an interest, right? Uh, the Al Capone thinks it is in his interest to shoot people and kill people. Well, implicit in the idea of individual rights is the view. That that's unacceptable. You know, we'll talk about whether it's interest or not, but it's unacceptable. That is not an appropriate way of pursuing one's interest. The appropriate way of pursuing one's interest is by using one's mind. The enemy of using one's mind is Al Capone. So we want to exclude Al Capone from the equation. And we need, in order to implement that, we need in order to implement the idea of excluding force we need to form an institution, a monopoly over the use of force, whose job is to exclude force. His job is to protect us from the use of force, from the Al Capones of the world. To arrest them, to objectively try them, and to punish them. Keep them away from the rest of us. So the concept of rights is a concept that bridges a morality of self-interest, a morality of pursuing your values, a morality of using your mind to pursue your interests. With, okay, well, what kind of political system does that mean? So it's a bridging concept between our morality and our politics and our social philosophy, our, our ideas about how we live in a social context. It's not ingrained in us. We don't have quote, natural rights in a sense that somehow they're implanted in us or they're given it to us by God. It's a concept that explains, explain how we must live if we are to pursue our happiness, to pursue our life in a social context. So you can see that capitalism now, this idea of capitalism, which is the idea of a system of government, where the government's sole responsibility is the protection of individual rights, is dependent now on a very specific conception of man. Man as thinking, a thinking being, a rational being, and man as needing freedom, freedom from coercion, freedom from force, in order to pursue his value. So it's a positive conception of the kind of world we need to create so that human beings can thrive, can flourish, can live their lives to the fullest, can take life seriously, and not be constrained and limited by other people's whims, other people's desires, Al Capone's, quote, interests, right? that impose significant limitations on our interests. By definition, that's what force does. So capitalism as an ideal is the system in which government sole responsibility is the protection of individual rights. It's a system in which there's a complete separation between the government and in a sense our lives, our economic lives. They have no interference in Steve Jobs' decision to build an iPhone his vision for it, the exact engineering that goes into it, the beauty or lack of beauty that appears in it. Government has no business in that. It has no business. Somebody serious going on. Is that because I said Steve Jobs? I don't know. It's Steve Jobs coming back. Um, it 
it has no business in that trade that I engage in with Apple. And telling me whether that trade is good or bad, right or wrong, how could it? It's based on my values and it's based on Apple's value. How do they know what my values are? I don't know what Apple's values are. That win-win relationship is none of their business. They have no role to play. So they have no role in the production side. They have no role in the trade side. And they have no role in my consumption decision. Note that today they have a role in every single one of them. Right? In the production side, all kinds of rules and regulations. Maybe the most dominant in the case of Apple because it's in a relatively unregulated business is employment law. All kinds of rules about how employees should be treated, how much they should be paid, and what, all of that, right? Uh, under trade, where I can buy it, under what terms I can buy it, and then, of course, there's usually a tax on top of the buying. And my consumption, the same kind of thing. In every one of these pieces, the state today has a role. In that sense, we don't live under capitalism. Even though I use Apple as an example of what capitalism produces, it's an example of what the ideal of capitalism, kind of the underlying ideal produces it, even though we don't have capitalism. It's like that. The, the, the idea of free production, the idea of free trade, the idea of, free cons of, of freedom and consumption. To the extent that we have it, we get iPhones. To the extent that we don't, we don't get iPhones. So capitalism is the system. It's grounded on this idea of rights. It's there to protect us from force for a reason. Always remember the reason. It's not, you know, too many particularly libertarians think, you know, freedom, liberty, capitalism, that's the ideal. That's what we're striving towards. That's the whole purpose. No. It is an ideal. But there's a reason it's an ideal. It's an ideal because we value our lives. It's an ideal because it's the only system that leaves us free to live a flourishing, successful life. It's an ideal because fundamentally only we as individuals could choose our own values and choose the path in pursuit of those values. Only we can reason for ourselves. And therefore capitalism is ideal because it allows us, leaves us free to pursue those values, to pursue that life. And it's why capitalism is incompatible with altruism. It's incompatible with the idea of self-sacrifice. Yes, in a sense, under capitalism, you are free to sacrifice yourself. But in a society that believes that sacrificing yourself is noble, is good, that altruism is the appropriate morality, Capitalism cannot survive. Because every one of the transactions, every one of the engagements, the whole principle of the system is built on your right to your own life, your right to your own happiness. That the purpose of your life is your own success. That is baked into capitalism. It's the reason it exists. It's the reason that political system evolved. It started from the idea that each one of us has a mind. Each one of us is capable of reason. Each one of us is an individual and his life is sacred. And now you want to tell me that, yeah, capitalism is great, but the real purpose of life is to sacrifice, that your life is meaningless, that the group is all important. Well, if the group is all important, why should I pursue my values? If the group is all important, Shouldn't Steve Jobs consult with other people about what the iPhone should include? Shouldn't he get permission from the government maybe to see what features he should or shouldn't include? Shouldn't he maybe take a vote or a poll? Or maybe even a, what do you call it, a focus group, a test group to see if people even like it because the purpose is not his vision, his values, his ideal. The purpose is satisfying others and sacrificing himself. And Iran, what are you buying an iPhone for? There are people starving in Africa. So why are you pursuing an iPhone? If altruism is serious, then why engage? Why aren't you giving money to starving people somewhere? And of course, if you're not Iran, 
Well, if you're not Steve Jobs, if you continue to pursue the self-interested goal, in spite of the fact that you know altruism is the right morality, then we're just going to have to do something about it. We're just going to have to use force to stop you. Oh, but you say force is bad. But why? Why is it bad if it achieves some social well-being? If it results in sacrifice, is sacrifice good? So, once you accept altruism, once you accept the morality of sacrifice, you can't be against force. And if the goal of force is ultimately the well-being of somebody who needs it, then it's okay. So all these attempts, and you see it all over the place from conservatives and libertarians to justify capitalism, some social utility perspective, or some uh, you know, idea of self-sacrifice, or idea of altruism that's good for the people, it cannot work. It never will work. It never has worked. And indeed, quite the opposite. Whatever freedoms we had, however close we got to capitalism, we are declining and moving away from it because of altruism. Because the only defenses have been from altruism, and they cannot stand in the face of the altruistic attack against them. Yeah, if the standard is the well-being of the poor, I shouldn't buy my iPhone. There are plenty of kids out there that need saving. And to be able to stand and say, tough, I'm going to buy the iPhone in spite of that, requires you to be self-interested. And not just be self-interested, but also have the kind of pride that Ankar talked about that says, I'm self-interested, I know it. And that's right, and that's just, and I understand why it's right and it's just. I'm not going to succumb to the guilt that you're trying to impose on me, which our whole society is constantly trying to impose on us, particularly on those who have been successful, particularly on those who have, uh, who have achieved great things, have produced great things, and achieved great fortunes. They're constantly under attack, trying to be guilted. And the sad tragedy in the world in which we live today is that they don't have the pride. They don't have the knowledge, many of them. They don't have the self-esteem and the confidence, the moral confidence to say, I don't feel guilty. What I'm doing is right and just. The wealth I've earned is mine. Objectivism would give them those words, would give them those ideas would change their soul to be able to do that and stand up in front of their supposed accusers if they allowed it to do so. It'd get books into their hands and they would take them seriously. So, capitalism is a system of individual rights. Capitalism is the system, really, of selfishness, of self-interest, of egoism. It's the antithesis of altruism. And it must be defended on the basis of individual rights, which can only be defended on a morality of egoism and, a, and the idea of selfishness. And a morality, a, a, a system that is a system of self-interest. It's not just interest. It's a whole, you know, a whole morality. Whole system of morality, and I really encourage you, those of you who haven't yet, to read The Virtue of Selfishness, to read the writings about what it entails, what all of this entails, what the morality entails, and why it's so important. And at the end of the day, it's important not because of capitalism, it's important because what it does to your life. It gives you the self esteem, the confidence to live a full life. It gives you Permission is the wrong word, but it gives you the, 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 the knowledge to take your life seriously, to live your life to the fullest, to achieve the flourishing and the happiness that every one of you is capable of. And only when you do that, I think, can you turn to changing the world. Can you turn to fighting for capitalism? So where do I use my iPhone? 
because I think it captures it captures everything that I find important about you know these ideas. It captures what the potential of capitalism is that is really achieved, and I think the iPhone symbolizes a case where it has been achieved. It symbolizes the kind of life that we could all be living, the kind of tools that we could all have, the kind of freedom that is possible in the world. It's about our own personal values, about we value as individuals. Right? That's why I can use the iPhone, because it truly is a value. I'm not lying to you. I'm not, it's not an act. Right? So when you think about capitalism, Rather than think as an abstraction, think about the things that are important in your life. Make it personal, because it is. It's about your life, your ability to be happy, your ability to be successful, your ability to take life seriously and thrive. Thank you. Nikos is gone. Where's Nikos? Oh, there you are. I missed by four minutes. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Questions on anything? Yeah. <laughs> Does it work? Yeah, yep. great. So in the view of ob objectivism, um, we should primarily be self-central and every care for the others is a derivative of that. Uh, but the care for others is many times important. Um, does it have any other name other than uh, benevolent? Uh, benevolent? Is, it, is this the name? And then I'm talking, I, I want to think for a second about a, a future society, a lesser fair society, where uh, I'm wondering <coughs> if, it, if it would be rational to judge other people according to, among other stuff, according to the level of, uh, of uh, benevolence. How much do they um, acknowledge other, other others people needs in the, in the trade of living together? And then even uh, another hypothetical question, is if I were a business owner in this futuristic, less affair capitalistic society, would it be rational f uh, for me to demand my employees to donate some of their money to a public organization as uh, some kind of proof of their uh, uh, benevolence? Yeah, that'll prove that they're benevolent when you force them, when you, when you require them to do it. That's very benevolent of them, right? Um, you know, they're just keeping their jobs. I'm not sure how that links to benevolence. But okay, so we'll get, we'll get to all of that, I think. I, I'm going to forget half the question you asked. First, I would never use the word self, the term self-centered. I, self I, I don't like it. I, you know, it's, it's, um, I don't think of myself as self-centered in the sense that the world revolves around me. I am the most important thing to me. But that doesn't mean the world revolves around me, which was self-centered means. I think self-centered is often actually the kind of negative selfishness that, you know, is, is about people that are self-centered. They, 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 they treat people, other people badly because other people are supposed to just revolve around them. So I would definitely separate those out. We're not self-centered. We're not advocating for that. Uh, other people, the value of other people uh, is, in a sense, they value to you, yes. But there's a sense in which they value to you because they're people, Right? Uh, so it's not that you're measuring, okay, you give me five and you give me four and, you know, and, and I don't know, know you, so I'm going to give you all. I, they, you, there's something about human life that is valuable to you. And that is the knowledge of how precious life is, how significant life is, how much life, uh, how beautiful life is, and how much that life can ultimately contribute to me. But that's just one of, I mean, think about, Think about the fact that we love some people, not me, but some of you love your pets. I don't have pets. But you like animals. Why? They have value to you. They give you something that's not particularly tangible, some kind of visibility they provide you. But part of it is that they're a living being. I, love, I like plants. Right? What do they give me? Nothing. 
<laughs> not visibility, right? They don't look you in the eyes with that sad look that dogs do. <laughs> and you can pretend that they actually know what you think. I don't know, whatever, right? Well, so why do I love a plant? Because it's a living thing. It's, it's this beauty in the fact that it's alive. So I love other human beings because they're, even, they're much more than plant, right? So I love them much more than I love a plant. So I think benevolence is one term, although, again, I think, in a sense, benevolence is a broader term because benevolence is a whole attitude towards the world, towards reality. It's not just a term that relates to your, your attitude towards other people. So I wouldn't use benevolence just in that context. Benevolence is a much broader term. It's, it's, it's your attitude towards the world and reality, and human beings are part of that. So you have a positive attitude towards human beings. You know, you could use charitable, you can use, uh, you know, you can just use uh, benevolence towards people, or you could just use nice to human beings. But again, I'm nice to human beings because they're human. Because human beings represent a value to me. Um, would I evaluate people and how much charity they give? I think that's what you were getting to. No, absolutely not. To a large extent, because you don't know what's going on in their lives. You don't know if the charity is a sacrifice, or if they have the money to give, or if they value the same causes as you value. It has to be their value. They have to know that this represents a value to them if they're going to be charitable toward them. And you can't evaluate that for them. And again, what if their child is sick and they, the, 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 the money is going to treat him in hospital, you know, just to make it dramatic, right? That they need to save the money for you. You don't know that. And then that's, and the whole point of, you know, in a sense, telling people that your, the terms of your employment require you to give charity. I mean, that's not a sign of benevolence. They want to keep their job. So they're going to give, they're going to give to charity, right? They're going to do what you tell them to do. Or they'll leave. Which is what they should do. Um, but, but it's, you're not embracing, you know, they're not embracing this kind of charitability. That would only be, that would have to be a choice that they make. And again, it has to be a choice within a context of their values, their lives, what's available to them. Now, if somebody's a jerk towards other people, if somebody really is nasty and horrible and doesn't like other human beings and treats them like shit, yeah, you evaluate that. But... You know, so evaluating human beings is complicated. But I, there's no, okay, how much does he give to charity as a line item that I, that I uh, use for that kind of decision? Plus, I, I've said this many times, I don't think charity is that important. I just don't know why the obsession with it. it hasn't really, you know, it, it helps some people in, in times of emergency, but it's just not that important for the most part. You know, uh, uh, life has gotten better on earth, not because of charity. Other people are better off, uh, uh, have come out of poverty, have succeeded in life, not because of chat. It's just not important. Either. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so my question relates one of the things that have become more relevant over the last two years again, which is vaccination and inoculation. I think it's very interesting that Ayn Rand stated that there is some room for the government to actually force inoculation um, on the population. Um, and I want to challenge that as in, in a, starting from the assumption that you would have a completely free society. I think that I don't see the reason uh, for the government intervention where, for example, a, a grocery store can choose who they want to leave into their store, what they require for them in terms of protection, in terms of inoculation. And then the same would go for uh, parks and what are now public spaces, what, what, what that would then be. Uh, private spaces again, so I don't really see the need for force in there, and I think that free market could, or the free, um, yeah, the free society could fix that itself. Yeah, so I think uh, absolutely. In 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 ninety nine percent of the cases, ninety nine point nine percent of the cases, uh, that works. That it, 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 you know, as long as we're completely free, as long as property is completely private then private individuals can make choices, private businesses can make choices, uh, can make choices about these things, and, that's, and that would work, right? But the two, two issues there. One is, there are going to be cases where that's not good enough, and when you, infected with a disease, constitute a threat on other people, and where private businesses cannot check on that. Imagine if Ebola, it wasn't COVID, 
it was Ebola. And Ebola, you get, you die. And it's, it's it, you know, it's hard to give to other people today, but imagine a strain of Ebola where you could, other people could get it easily. And you're a walking threat by the very nature of you being out there among people. You are violating their rights. So what Rand said is, it is absolutely appropriate for the government to take a person like that and isolate them. And exclude them from being a threat to other people. So the government has a position there. And, and it's not like the store owner knows if you have Ebola or not. Right? You could lie. Remember, the, the government is there to protect us from people who don't respect our rights. Right? If they all respected our rights, if nobody committed murder, you know, maybe, the, maybe we wouldn't need any government, right? But that's not the case. There's always somebody who's going to, I mean, we'd always need a government for a variety of positive reasons, but even the protection function depends on the fact that there exist people out there with bad motives and bad reasons who are not rational, who do stupid things. And you need a government to protect. It's absolutely appropriate for the government in certain circumstances, and these circumstances need to be made objective. They need to be clearly defined, and I'm not going to do that right now, but they need it because I don't know. But that this is real thinking. Needs, I mean, I recommend Uncle Gatte's essay on, on, on COVID that was published was two years ago now, or a year and a half ago, um, where he kind of lays out what would it look like under a free market to actually have a legal regime that respected individual rights and what would be the role of government under such a process? I think that's, you know, you would have to define what kind of disease would the government get involved in. So that would be one mark. And then, and then what kind of involvement, depending on how bad it was, and what would that involvement look like? But you would have to define all these things. But to say, no, you know, in freedom, we can take care of it. Well, we can take care of everything. And, you know, but no, we can't. Because you constitute a threat to other people and... There are plenty of irrational people out there that we want protection. And remember, we don't live under capitalism. That's the other aspect. There's plenty of stuff in the world in which we live today that is not private property. So what do you do about all the stuff that, I mean, yes, in a, in a laissez-faire capitalist society, there's certain things that would happen that you cannot, you cannot apply today. And in, you know, in cases like this, you have to deal with public property and public spaces and what happens and you know, whether we like it or not, the governments run the hospitals or they control the hospitals. So it, it, once, once a government runs a hospital, then, you know, how does it make sure that it's not overrun? And it, it becomes, once rights are violated, once the government gets involved in our lives, it can't just say, well, in this case, we're just letting the hospitals overrun because, hey, laissez-faire. But there's no laissez-faire. So it's, it, mixed economies are hard, and it's hard to decide what is right and what is wrong politically within a mixed economy because of that, because the, the, the government restricts all the hospital beds, it doesn't allow new hospital beds, and then when the hospital beds are needed, it just says, well, now I'm going to leave it alone and let, 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 let them all collapse, who cares? So you, you, it's one of the evils of having a mixed economy is that the government has to do a lot more than it should do in times of an emergency. In, in a free market, government would have no involvement in hospitals, they wouldn't care about hospital capacity. That would be a private sector problem, and that would be an issue. But we don't live in that world. So the government has to care about hospital capacity because it's responsible for hospital capacity. Okay, thanks. Go. Debbie. So you are not in a mixed economy, but in a culture that embraced capitalism and individual rights properly uh, understood. How would that culture react to the war in Ukraine um, and to somebody like President Zelensky, his calls for help? Well, I mean, the problem is that <laughs> what happened in Ukraine wouldn't happen in such a culture. That is, Putin wouldn't dare. Um, so in a, in a culture that respected freedom, that respected individualism, that respected property, um, you know, Putin wouldn't dare to do what he did. A culture that would have responded to his previous uh, acts of aggression properly, he wouldn't care to escalate those acts of aggression. It's only our weakness. It's only a lack of principle. It's only the fact that we didn't respond to the acts of aggression in the past that made this possible. But I think the appropriate question then is, uh, you know, so, okay, so let's say the culture converted today. Well, what should our attitude be right now? Um, and look, Russia is an aggressor. And, and it's an aggressor. It's using force. It's invaded another country. It is unequivocally 
the bad guy here. There's nothing positive to say about Russia. And none of these so-called, oh, they were afraid of NATO. None of that is any of their business. NATO is not an aggressor, has not been an aggressor against Russia. Russia is at fault here. So it's a, it's a bad actor. And then the question is, what do you do about it? What is the appropriate response in a rational world towards it? Well, uh, if you're in Europe and you're worried uh, and, and you see this and you live in Europe and, 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 and let's say Russia was capable of taking Ukraine, it looks like they're not, but let's say they were capable of taking Ukraine, then what's next? And if I were Poland or Slovakia or, you know, anybody on that border, Romania, um, you know, even Germany, I'd be worried. It's a real threat. He's clearly expressed ambitions that go beyond the border of Ukraine. He's expressed ambitions toward the Balkans, and he's expressed ambitions towards the old Soviet Union. You know, Putin said that the greatest tragedy of the 20th century is not World War I or World War II or the Holocaust or anything like that. It was the breakup of the Soviet Union. So he has a goal to do, do away with that breakup. You have to take that seriously. And as Europe, I would think that you would mount a defense of Europe, of your own country. And that would mean helping Ukraine in whatever way possible, defeating the Russians in whatever way possible without igniting a nuclear war. How to do that exactly is probably beyond the scope of my knowledge. But can't just sit back. This is a real threat to every person who likes whatever freedom we still have in Europe. Now, I don't think that's the case for America. America is far away. Putin is not a threat to America. This is why I don't think America should be part of NATO. I think NATO should be an alliance to protect Europe. Europe has a threat. It's called Russia today. It's there to protect from Russia. The United States doesn't even even evolve. Europe is rich. It's wealthy. You can mount an army. And, and by the way, conventional warfare-wise, NATO would crush Russia in days. You can see how pathetic they are, you know, versus Ukraine. So, yeah, I mean, this would be something that you would actually, you would actually get involved in. Um, in terms of evaluating Zelensky, look, he, before the war, he was a very mixed because, you know, there was a lot of corruption, continued to be a lot of corruption in Ukraine. It wasn't exactly the symbol and emblem of freedom. Uh, it was better. It was moving generally in the right direction. I visited Kiev a number of times and clearly... The desire was to become more Western. The desire was to move towards more freedom. They were struggling to figure out how to do that given the history of corruption that was really ingrained into their political system. They were trying to figure, you know, when you, when you have every president kind of be corrupt, it's hard suddenly to be the good guy who cleans everything up and without also seeming to be destroying democracy. Now, I'm not saying Zelensky did that or didn't. I don't know enough about it. But generally, the trend was positive trend. But once the war started, the guy has risen to the challenge in an unbelievably inspiring way. I mean, he's a hero. He basically has stood his ground. He's fighting, not for some mythical collectivist idea of Ukraine in the same way Putin is. Putin is fighting for a mystical Russia. And, and all you have to do is listen to his speeches. He talks about this. the soul of the Russian people, the, the unity of the Russian whatever, right? It's complete mysticism and complete and utter, unmitigated collectivism. Zelensky's fighting for his home, fighting for his family. One of the most inspiring things about him, but generally about all the Ukrainians interviewed, is that they know exactly what they're fighting for. They're fighting for their family, their life, their home, their little community. And yes, Ukraine as, as, a, as, a, as a relatively free state. But it always starts when you ask them with themselves, with their own life with their own property, with their own people they love, in, in a, in a, you know, in a self-interest. Why, why, why should people, why would an egoist ever fight in a war? Because their life depended on it. Because their values depended on it. Because their freedom depended on it. And you've seen that come through it, with the Ukrainians uh, as they fight. I think this war is uh, illustrative of a lot of different things. You know, the, 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 the why authoritarianism can never really be successful uh, why are people highly motivated by their own selfish reasons are far, are far more likely to win a war than are people motivated by mysticism and nothingness? Why weapons in the West are far superior to weapons from Russia? All of these things, I mean, you're seeing, it's a real, I mean, there's a real learning opportunity here 
uh, in, in terms of what collectivism and what mysticism and what nationalism produces versus what the potential of freedom to produce is. And that contrast, hopefully people will learn something from it, but it's right in front of us. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so this iPhone is mine. Your iPhone is yours. We both have the freedom to utilize this tangible property. Yep. The intangible idea behind it, I'm not quite sure. So my question to you is, if someone made that exact same technology identically um, using their own resources and own materials, what gives us the right to, initi use, to initiate force against them for utilizing their property as such? Intellectual property rights, essentially. Yeah. So, because somebody created the ideas, the intellectual property, that put all that together, that every one of those elements is a product of a human brain, of a human mind. And you're copying it. And you're not rewarding the person who invented it. Somebody actually, it, it's, it's no different than physical property in that sense, right? I, the, to make a physical property yours, you put work into it. It's yours. You can't take it, not just because I happen to draw a line around it, because it involves my effort, my work, my action. In a, in, in, the intellectual property that goes into the phone is the product of somebody's mind. And they own it. They own it just like they own other products of their mind. Now it's different, so it has a life set, limited lifespan, and all of that, and all kinds of laws and 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 control and different application. It's applied in different ways in physical property, but fundamentally, it's the fact that somebody created it, and you just you know copying it is a rejection and and uh, of the fact that somebody else made it right you're not you're not compensating them for the fact that you're just copying and you should and indeed that's what intellectual property rights usually do is you go negotiate with them you buy the right to use it and you use it it's not like it limits the ability to use these things look at samsung how similar is that to an iphone very it doesn't actually limit what happens under a free market Say, uh, hypothetically, this person made the product without knowing of um, the original innovator in that sense. Yeah. <clears throat> would, would that still be immoral from the part of the, from your perspective? The, I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be moral for somebody who invented it from scratch and didn't copy anything to do it, but it would be illegal. Okay. Because the law recognized the property ownership of this person. It grants them a certain lifespan, and the new person entering is violating that. So he was innocent. He didn't know. You don't blame him morally for doing that, but you don't facilitate it because the person who invented it originally, the guy who, the guy who comes for, coming in first matters. And doing it first gives him his ability to profit from it. And if you're taking that away from him, that would be illegal in a free society. How would you objectively determine the lifespan of the, say, patent? I don't have an answer to that. Okay. I mean, talk to uh, Adam Ossoff or read Ayn Rand's essay. I mean, there has to be some consideration of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of who invented it, you, you know, the, enough time for them to be able to make profits off of it, but without it going on forever so that it stifles all future innovation. How you actually come up with that length is for legal philosophers nothing okay. too hard. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, Ayn Rand just got an essay in Capitalism Not an Ideal, a book I recommend everybody read on patents and copyrights. She 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 goes through the reasoning how you would set that time frame, um, and uh, and I think that makes I think that that reasoning makes sense. What the exact number is, I think, is going to depend on a variety of different contextual issues. Um, and it's probably in some cases today too long for some things and too short for other things because today it's not determined by any kind of legal philosophical methodology. Today it's determined by political 
lobbying. It's determined by, by pull politics, right? Like Disney has a lot of power. So uh, Mickey Mouse's copyright has been extended basically for e- almost forever. Uh, other people don't have political power, pharmaceutical companies, their patent rights are probably shorter than they should be. Yeah. Uh, you touched on the great opportunities we have, for example, to buy an iPhone or not. But if we look at other countries around the world, uh, there are very poor people who live in unimaginably unimaginably conditions, and they don't have that opportunity. Why isn't it unfair that they don't have that opportunity and don't have the same education as we have to make those choices? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible that they don't. And um, this is why it's important to fight for capitalism. If you care about human life, if you care about people's opportunities, if you, if you want people to have the opportunities to live successful, good, happy life, if you, you know, as benevolent beings, we want that, then yes. And the solution to that is capitalism. The solution to that is freedom. There's a reason why we are relatively rich and they're relatively poor in terms of countries. And the reason is always the kind of political system they live under versus the kind of political system we live under, the ideas that animate us versus the ideas that animate them. And, and it's, 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 you know, we, so if you care about that, all those philanthropists who seem to care a lot about Africa, cool, they should be promoting capitalism in Africa. And that would get people out of poverty, it would allow them to buy iPhones, it will increase the number of opportunities they have, and, and that's just on the material side, but fundamentally, they could pursue happiness, they could actually use their reason, think about all the increased production that would be in the world, all of us would be better off, everybody becomes better off as everybody becomes freer. So, yeah, I, you know, it's not like I don't care about the fact that there are poor people in parts of the world that can't benefit from all the wonders, it's, we do care, but that the solution is not me sacrificing the opposite. The solution is to bring them the kind of freedom and liberty that we know works. Uh, with decentralization being a rising term in the space of Web3, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and the eminent metaverse, uh, I'm interested to get a real take on an objectivist view of these technologies and what it could do for pushing human innovation forward. Um, well, the problem is that half of those things, I don't know what they are. I mean, I kind of know what they are, but I don't really know what they are. So, so I'm, I'm winging it to a large extent, right? Uh, look, objectivism it doesn't have a position in any particular technology. We're pro-technology. We're pro-progress. We're pro-innovation. Um, so it really depends on, to some extent, w- what all that means. If you, think, if, if, if you think, as some people think, that crypto, that crypto will save the world and we'll all become free uh, and we'll, have to, we'll skip over philosophy and we'll skip over politics and we'll skip over that and we'll just be free because we're living in a... Then no, that ain't happening. The solution to the world's problem is not Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin might be fantastic. It might be a great tool, it might be a great product, it might be really, really important. It won't solve our problem. And putting on 3D glasses and living in the metaverse is not living. It's, it's entertainment. It's, it's, it could be more than entertainment. There might be trade there. There might be spiritual values there. There might be a lot of stuff there. But you still live in a physical world and force is still applied to you on the physical world. And as long as that case, you're not free. You, you, know, you, you might be free for those moments that you're out there. And, and even that is probably controlled because there are probably limits on what they can show you and what they can screen and who you are and, and they're gathering information about you and all kinds of things, right? And they might use who you shoot and who you don't shoot to, 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 to politically categorize you and give you a social score. And who knows, right, how this is going to be used. So it, it doesn't solve the political problem. There's no shortcuts in that sense. Uh, so I'm all, you know, uh, generally I'm pro all innovations even when I don't understand them. Um, I'm generally pro-technology and, and moving forward. I, I resist the temptation of, of uh, blaming all our problems, I don't know, on social media or this technology and that, because I'm old enough to remember when all our problems were b- blamed on kids listening to the radio too much or watching TV too much or listening to radio. I'm not that old. But watching TV, <laughs> I am. Uh, and um, 
So, uh, so I'm skeptical about the fact that technology is the problem. You know, it's our ideas that are the problem. We won't change the world. But I am very pro-innovation, very pro-progress. It excites me that these things are happening. There's a sense in which it excites me that I don't understand them because that means they're over there, which is great, right? That they're pushing ahead faster than I can keep up. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm generally very excited about technology. Biotech in particular right now excites me. CRISPR, gene editing, you know, super babies, whatever. Um, I, I'm excited about those technologies. I'm excited about the ability to enhance human life and, and expand the realm of opportunities to pursue happiness, which I think technology allows Thank you. I mean, I'm look, waiting for the day where I show my iPhone and we go, oh, that old product, you know. <laughs> We're way ahead of that. So that, that'll be cool. Yeah. Uh, what's an objectivist response no, to... No, no. I... Oh, a bit lower. No, just start the question at the mic, not... Oh, okay. The... There you go. Okay. Uh, what's an objectivist response to strategic threats? So if it's, um, say, uh, Huawei bidding for 5G infrastructure in the UK... Huawei what? Oh. Uh, Huawei bidding for 5G infrastructure in the UK... Or if it's um, North Korea, Huawei, Huawei, Chinese company. Oh, Huawei, oh, Huawei. Okay. Uh, or if it's if it's uh, Nord Stream Two, where Germany and Russia were collaborating, uh, and if it's more protectionism, is there a route for uh, well-behaved countries to eventually collaborate cross borders? Yeah, it's so hard uh, in a world where, where foreign policy is not guided by any principle. Uh, in a world where almost all governments are mixed economies and mixture of authoritarianism and freedom, um, it, to then give specific advice about a particular project. Um, I mean, if something like Nord Stream 2 requires government uh, authorization and uh, Germany is sitting there and knows, you know, the German government has to approve it uh, or maybe even fund it, and they know they're going to become dependent on Russia, well then, of course, why would they do it? It's like, duh. And right now they're going through the duh moment, right, where they're realizing, yeah, but we, everybody knew this. No, it doesn't surprise anybody, right? Uh, they shut down the nuclear power plants. I mean, you can go on and on about all of German strategic uh, uh, challenges as a mixed economy where the government is involved in making itself, making itself dependent completely on Russia. Right? Why don't you, in the UK, those of you who live in the UK, why aren't you fracking? There is, I don't know how many decades worth of natural gas right under the soil, right here in the UK, uh, available relatively for free, not for free, but relatively cheaply, energy companies want to get at it, and the government won't let you. And yet everybody talks about these and options and those, are, and nobody talks about it. It's right here. The solution is right here. Just freedom is the solution. Huawei is a, a different is a difficult issue, right? If there's reason to believe Huawei is this uh, telecommunication Chinese telecommunication company, if there's reason to believe, and there probably is, that Huawei is being used by the Chinese government to spy on us, and it it be, it, it could be taken over by the Chinese government, and therefore our infrastructure would be shut down, then the solution is not the solution is then to ban Huawei. And yes, should free countries band together to exclude? certain companies or certain entities that, that threaten it? Yes, they should, right? We shouldn't have a United Nations. It's an abomination. We should have a United Free Country Alliance. I don't know what you want to call it, right? And that is where these kind of issues would be discussed. But the point is, I think the point, the more important point is that in a world in which a country like America actually stood for freedom and liberty and actually had self-respect, and pursued its own uh, interests in the world stage, and protected individual rights, and represented capitalism, none of these issues would come up. Right? You wouldn't have to defend Taiwan because they wouldn't dare. And it wasn't that they wouldn't dare because America might intervene, but because they wouldn't dare. Because they'd know what was involved. And they wouldn't dare, uh, and, 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 and highway wouldn't be even an issue. Of course, you don't deal with you know, authoritarians or people who want to kill you or real threats to you. Everything is much clearer once you stand on the good guy side. But if you're not a good guy, if you're like mixed, you're better, you're much better, but you're not quite good and you don't, and you're certainly not proud of being good and you don't assert the fact that you're good and you don't associate only with good people. I mean, I've said 
you know, this, my foreign policy, I, I wouldn't have an embassy in China. I wouldn't have an embassy in Russia. I wouldn't have an embassy in about 150 countries in the world, right? Why do we recognize diplomatically authoritarian? Why do we have an embassy in Saudi Arabia? We shouldn't have, as a government, not as a people, you might want to trade with them, but as a, as a government, why do you sanction regimes that are evil and hostile? So, but that's, that's unimaginable. Right now we're sanctioning everybody in Russia, but we still have an ambassador there. And we still have diplomatic relations. And we still treat them as a legitimate country. And there's still a security council of the United Nations. But we really think they're evil. And then Biden says, Putin shouldn't be president. And everybody flips out. You can't say that. How can you say that? How can you intervene in the internal affair? And what are we doing? It's exactly, we're saying they're evil. But you can't say they're evil. Because, you know, you don't, nobody has the self-esteem, the confidence to actually do it. So Biden did it by accident. Because almost everything he does, I think, is by accident. And, <laughs> but it turned out to be a really good thing that he did. And yet the world is accusing him of, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans all accusing him of, you can't say that. You can't call for the deposition of foreign leader. Why? So it's a whole, I mean, our view of foreign policy is, is so different than anything that exists out there. It's hard to apply it here. and not. You, you have to have a, a holistic view. And if America actually represented capitalism and freedom, actually didn't have diplomatic relations with certain countries and, and, and it allowed individuals to trade um, unless you are a threatening country and then you have an embargo, then the whole world would be different. Everything would be different. And, and none of these issues would even come up. But that's science. it seems like science fiction, right? Because it's so far removed from... I, I once did a... a, 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 a Nikos wants me to finish. I, I, I once did a class, a, a, a talk to, to a foreign relations class. Right, they were studying at some university foreign relations, and I just described kind of my attitude towards foreign policy and how I would do things and how I would relate to other countries and, and so on. And at the end, and there were a lot of questions, it was really good interaction and everything, but at the end, the, the professor, the guy, he said, I've never heard anything like that. Um, where do you get this stuff from? It's not in any of the books I read. It's not in any of the foreign policy stuff that I've studied in college and university. It just isn't. Objectivism is so different than everything else out there. And once you start applying it to practical reality, the conclusions, the outcome is so different than everything that's out there that they don't even know how to categorize it. If they, if they give it, if they're serious enough to actually consider it, they don't know where to put it. Are we realists? Are we pragmatists? Are we this? Are we that? No, we're not any of those. We're objectivists. And that's different. Thank you.